our mic on? Good morning, everybody. We have our chairman here this morning who uh, would like to welcome us all to the beginning of this uh, uh, convening of this important uh, CHAP. Uh, I think Mike has just left the area, but <laughs> he'll be back in in a moment. But please let me introduce the, the chairman of the CPSC, Inez Tenenbaum. Good morning, chairman. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is very exciting time for us here at the CPSC. We have not convened a CHAP in many years, so we are just delighted that all of you have agreed to serve on this very important committee, and uh, we uh, w just want you to know how much we appreciate the time and effort that it will take to devote uh, uh, the serious science to this issue. The work you're undertaking is extremely important to this agency and to Congress, who uh, in the CPSIA, which is how we refer to the Consumer Product Safety Improvement uh, Act, ask us to uh, uh, impanel this esteemed group of experts to study the effects on children's health on all phthalate and phthalate alternatives. Our agency's current phthalate limits apply to children's toys and children's uh, child care articles. Uh, there are nuances in the statutes that you will become much more familiar with in your work here. And what is important for you to recognize about your charge from Congress is that you are to look broader in thinking about the risk and likely exposure scenarios. The work this panel has been charged uh, with by Congress goes beyond the exposure that might occur when children play with toys or sleep in their cribs. You have been asked to examine the range of exposures, including the exposures that could occur before birth. You've also been asked what exposures can occur from things such as personal care products, which may not even be in our jurisdiction. The goal is to get the best scientific evaluation about the uncertainties regarding exposure and the particular susceptibility of children and pregnant women. We can't think of a better group of people who are assembled here to evaluate the best available science and advise us on how to protect America's children. So we look forward to working with you over the course of the next year, and we hope that uh, you will uh, enjoy your work as much as we appreciate your being here. Also, feel free to call me at any time. My office is on the seventh floor, and uh, if you have any questions or need assistance, you know I'm here to help you in any way. So thank you for, for serving. Thank you very much, Chairman Tenenbaum. And let me second uh, Chairman's sentiments that we appreciate very much your efforts, the efforts of the CHAP, uh, in the work that you will be doing in the coming months. <clears throat> and we look forward to working with you. Uh, let me welcome you all to the first meeting of the Chronic Hazard Advisory Panel on Phthalates. I'm Michael Babich. I'm the Project Manager for Phthalates at CPSC. And it's my uh, honor to introduce to you the members of the CHAP on Phthalates. Uh, if perhaps if the members wouldn't mind introducing themselves, uh, starting with Dr. Koch. Yeah, please. Well, I'm uh, Holger Koch from Germany. I'm working for the German Social Accident Insurance, uh, which is uh, also an institute for occupational and prevention. Um, it's a university institute at the Ruhr University, Bochum. I'm, I have done a lot of work on phthalates regarding exposure, biomonitoring, exposure assessment in some parts, also risk assessment. Maybe some of you know some of my publications in this field. I think that should be. You. Uh, my name is Phil Merkus, and uh, I've been retired since 2008. Uh, but prior to that, I was uh, spent most of my career at the University of Washington in the Department of Pediatrics, and I'm a developmental toxicologist. 
Hi, I'm Russ Hauser, and I'm from the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School. I'm trained as a, a physician and epidemiologist. And uh, Byrne? My name is Bernard Schwetz. <clears throat> I, my primary training and experience background is as a toxicologist, and within that, primarily reproductive and developmental toxicology. Two years ago, I retired after 25 years in the U.S. Public Health Service. And in, I have worked for industry. I've worked within NIH. I worked within the FDA. And I, more recently, before I retired, I, I was the director of the Office for Human Research Protections within the Department of Health and Human Services. And that's the office <clears throat> that is responsible for oversight of all research involving human subjects that is either conducted or sponsored by HHS. I'm Chris Jennings. I'm a professor of biostatistics at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. And I've been interested in um, uh, development of, of um, methods and design um, issues for studies of chemical mixtures for quite a while. I'm Andreas Kortenkamp. I'm a professor in toxicology at the School of Pharmacy in University of London. Um, I'm mainly concerned with endocrine disruptors and in particular with uh, mixture effects of endocrine disruptors. I've served on the National Research Council Committee which produced the report Phthalates, the tasks ahead. Um, really my expertise is in assessing and evaluating the effects of uh, multiple chemicals. Oh. Morning. My name is Okay. Thank you. And I'd like to also introduce the, the, uh, some of the phthalates team members. Uh, Dominique, would you? Yes, I'm Dominique Williams, and I'm one of the toxicologists here at CPSC. Ken Carlson, I'm also a toxicologist here at CPSC. And Cheryl Osterhout, I'm a pharmacologist. Thank you. I'm Michael Green. I'm a statistician. Thank you. And uh, my, my colleagues at CPSC have uh, helped prepare some of the documents that uh, were prepared in advance for the, for the CHAP to assist them in their duties. Let me talk a little bit about uh, today's agenda. Uh, first, I'm going to give a little bit of the background and history of this project of the work on phthalates that's been done at CPSC uh, for uh, um, a couple of decades. Uh, um, there also will be a, a, an overview of phthalates, a, a very uh, quick and uh, uh, brief overview of the chemistry of phthalates and, and some of the uh, important uh, toxicological issues. Um, and we will also talk about the, uh, the charge of this chap, the scope of the work that uh, is outlined in the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 2008. Uh, when we're uh, done, when the staff is done briefing the CHAP, uh, providing the background information and so on, uh, we will take a break. Uh, it'll probably be lunchtime by then. Uh, but when we reconvene, we will, the, the CHAP will elect a chair and a vice chair. 
and at that point the chair will take over the meeting and the chap will begin its deliberations um, and outlining its its work um, and uh, let me just say that we uh, appreciate the the work the willingness of the chat members to serve um, and we're extremely impressed by the uh, by the by the knowledge and experience and ability that they bring to this panel um, so a little bit of the of the, the background the sort of institutional history on uh, phthalates at CPSC in the 1980s DEHP was the principal phthalate that was used in children's products things like uh, teethers soft plastic toys uh, and so on uh, but then the National Toxicology Program reported that DEHP caused liver tumors in mice and rats so uh, the CPSC initiated a rulemaking process uh, we conducted a risk assessment did some research on exposure uh, and convened a chronic hazard advisory panel uh, eventually however the manufacturers simply uh, removed DEHP from teethers rattles and pacifiers these are the uh, children's articles that they considered uh, intended to be placed in a child's mouth that voluntary ban was later incorporated into an ASD standard uh, known uh, commonly as the toy safety standard and so eventually the uh, in, in because of the voluntary ban the rulemaking proceeding was terminated um, and for the most part DEHP was replaced by another phthalate DINP now in uh, about 1998 uh, we were petitioned to ban PVC in children's products not just phthalates but actually PVC uh, the petitioners Greenpeace and others actually ten different groups uh, uh, mentioned phthalates uh, lead and other heavy metals as the potential uh, health risks associated with PVC um, and so we began to investigate uh, at that time the manufacturers voluntarily removed uh, all phthalates from teethers and rattles by that time there were no phthalates in pacifiers that we were aware of uh, <coughs> and they did this uh, while we uh, conducted our examination um, to assess the the potential D DINP risk we did three things first we convened a, a, a CHAP uh, the purpose of the CHAP was to consider the potential chronic hazards from DINP in these children's products uh, but, but especially uh, at the time the concern was about the liver tumors that DEHP and DINP produce in rodents these liver tumors are associated with perox a process called peroxisome proliferation and there was a question as to whether uh, these tumors were relevant to humans because the, the question is what there, there was no evidence of that peroxisome proliferation would occur in humans uh, so that was our actually our primary motivation in convening the CHAP uh, we also conducted a study of children's mouthing activity we observed uh, children uh, uh, about 200 children uh, up to three years of age uh, looked at what they put in their mouths how frequently and how often and one of the findings of that study is that children's mouthing activity it's a very intermittent process uh, a toy or a teether will go in and out of the child's mouth many times during the course of a day but the actual time it's in their mouth is is was much less than we expected before this we and others had assumed that children uh, 
you know, had teethers in their mouth for hours and pacifier, pacifiers in their mouth for, you know, many hours a day. And we found that that wasn't true, uh, that in fact the most common thing that children mouth is their fingers. Um, uh, and they mouth just about everything that they can get their hands on. But most of those things, it's very infrequent. Um, we also uh, worked on laboratory methods for measuring uh, DINP migration uh, uh, to, to estimate oral exposure from children um, mouthing these articles. Uh, there was a method uh, developed in Europe, and uh, it was actually validated with uh, volunteers, adult human volunteers, um, uh, to, uh, to measure the amount of DINP that can migrate into saliva. So, uh, the CHAP concluded, uh, they published their report in 2001, they concluded that the, the cancer risk was negligible or non-existent. They said that the process of peroxisome proliferation is, is not easily inducible, at, at the least, is not easily inducible in humans, and therefore uh, there was little or no uh, cancer risk from uh, that process, and therefore the liver tumors were not re considered relevant. Uh, they also concluded that DINP exposure from mouthing uh, teethers, rattles, and soft plastic toys uh, posed a minimal to non-existent risk. And the, the critical endpoint, the, the most sensitive endpoint for DINP uh, in the absence of the liver tumors became chronic uh, liver toxicity. Uh, DINP, uh, of course, some people are concerned about endocrine disruption or developmental effects. DINP is uh, less potent than some of the other phthalates in inducing those kinds of effects. So uh, in that case, the uh, uh, liver was the most sensitive endpoint and therefore was used to, uh, uh, for that risk assessment. Uh, Later on, when all the other work was completed, the observation study and the laboratory work, uh, the staff, we, we had a little more data to work with, and we also concluded that soft plastic toys, teethers, and rattles were not hazardous, hazardous to children. I think we had a little uh, more data, so a little more confidence in our conclusions. Uh, so the petition w to ban PVC uh, was denied, uh, partly because of this work and, and some other work that was done. Uh, the main limitation of uh, the work on DINP is that it was one phthalate um, in one class of products. Um, of course, even in 1998 and 2000, uh, people were concerned about the aware that we were exposed to multiple phthalates and concerned about the, the cumulative risks, but we just didn't have the tools to do a, a cumulative risk assessment um, at, that we have today. Uh, a lot of the key papers, uh, you know, Earl Gray's, uh, some of Earl Gray's papers and some of the early uh, biomonitoring studies were just uh, published as we were finishing up the work. Uh, and, uh, you know, the work, how to shells, uh, paper on the mixture, and, the, you know, the NRC report, uh, Swan's uh, paper uh, were all published since then. So, um, in, 19, uh, in 2008, uh, Congress passed the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, and one se section of this act applies to phthalates, Section 108, and uh, it does a number of things. First, it, it bans the use of three phthalates, uh, dibutyl phthalate, butyl benzyl, and DEHP, at uh, a level of more than 0.1% in children's toys and child care articles. 
It also bans on an interim basis uh, three additional phthalates, DINP, DIDP, and DNOP. These are banned uh, from children's toys that can be placed in a child's mouth and child care articles. Now, the Act defines children's toy as uh, a product that's uh, marketed and intended for use by a child while playing. It's a, it's a broad definition, and in fact, the staff is right now working on clarifying that definition exactly what does that, you know, does that include, uh, obviously it includes dolls and action figures and so on, rubber duckies, uh, but does it include things like, you know, tricycles and bicycles and sporting, uh, sports equipment? Uh, the staff is working on clarify, flying, clarifying these definitions right now, uh, but it's important to note that the definition of children's toy and the child care articles, the scope of the CPSIA is much broader than the risk assessments that we have done previously. Uh, they also define child care article uh, somewhat, uh, in a somewhat narrow way. They limit it to articles uh, for use, uh, marketed and intended for use by children three and under, uh, that facilitate feeding, mouthing, what is it, sleeping, feeding, and teething. Uh, so it would not necessarily include uh, children's clothing, for example, or things for bathing, child care products, uh, or uh, uh, not necessarily include the whole scope of what people might consider a child care product. Um, also, the, um, the interim ban, uh, apply, in the case of toys, it's only toys that can be placed in a, in a child's mouth. And, the, and they have a definition if there's a, a certain size, I forget how many centimeters in one dimension, then it's small enough to fit in a child's mouth. Um, also, uh, would like to point out the uh, European Union passed a, a, a very similar regulation uh, several years ago, and uh, that involves the same three, uh, the same six phthalates. But if you're familiar with that regulation, uh, the details, the scope, and so on, the products that are covered, there are uh, differences between the CPSIA regulation and the European regulation, and I know that causes uh, some confusion because that regulation uh, has been existence for, in existence for a while, and a lot of people assume it's the same, uh, but the, some of the details differ, and in fact, we're still working out what some of those details uh, will be. And uh, it also, uh, Calls for us, uh, calls on us, the CPSC, to convene a chap on phthalates and phthalate substitutes. Uh, this is to address the cumulative risks from exposure to uh, phthalates uh, in children's products uh, as well as all other sources of exposure and potential phthalate substitutes. So, uh, let me just take a little a little break here um, and ask the panel if there are any questions. Um, okay. Um, Continuing on, uh, I'd like to give a, a, a very uh, a, a brief and not very detailed overview of phthalates, both the chemistry and the toxicology of the potential health effects. Uh, and of course, in doing so, I realize that some of the people on the chat, some of the people in the audience know uh, a lot more about this than I do. Uh, I also realize that 
There's so much information that I can't possibly cover everything. I'm bound to omit some details that uh, may be important to the risk assessment. And depending on, you know, uh, your expert uh, expertise, you may feel is, is I'm leaving out something critical. And I don't want to, uh, anyone have the impression that I'm trying to leave something out or glossing over something just because of the, uh, the, the short time uh, I, I need to talk in generalities. Um, and I want to do this because I know uh, some of the, the chat members in their work are very much focused on phthalates per se, have a lot of experience with phthalates. Uh, others may not. So I just wanted to, to take an opportunity to give uh, uh, a brief ov overview so that we have sort of a common starting point. Uh, when we're talking about phthalates, we're really talking about uh, we're really talking about uh, dialkyl esters of orthophthalate, uh, as shown in the general structure here. Uh, based on information from EPA, I estimate that there's uh, about 30 commercial products uh, known as phthalates. Uh, in the literature, you could actually find there's probably a, a couple hundred phthalates at, at least. Um, of these 30 uh, phthalates, uh, maybe half of them are high production volume chemicals. And uh, metabolites of at least 10 of these have been detected in, in human uh, urine and other uh, human or blood or other, uh, other fluids. Now, 90% of the phthalate production, or probably maybe more, is used as uh, plasticizers for PVC. Uh, the Dave Barry, the, the writer, says that the four building blocks of the universe are fire, water, gravel, and vinyl. Uh, so it's no doubt that, uh, I mean, this is why we're here, this is why uh, phthalates are so ubiquitous, why there are so many, why they are uh, uh, such important commercial products. The other 10% of plasticizer production uh, has uh, uses uh, that you might call all of the above. They're solvents, uh, they can be plasticizers, and they, they tend to show up, you can't uh, it's hard for me to get a handle on all the uses. They tend to show up in places where I don't expect them to be. Uh, anyway, these are uh, viscous uh, liquids. They're hydrophobic. Some of them are extreme uh, hydrophobes. They have log K values, uh, eight or nine. Um, generally, low vapor pressures, uh, they're semi-volatile. Um, and their physico-chemical properties are determined in part by the carbon backbone, both the length of the carbon backbone and the, and the branching. And that uh, this, in turn, affects how a particular phthalate is used in products, uh, what it's used for. It affects exposure, and it can even affect the uh, toxicology of the phthalates, as we'll see in a little bit. Um, the industry classifies phthalates into three types. There are the, the shorter chain or low molecular weight phthalates, uh, like dimethyl phthalate and diethyl phthalate, are used mainly as solvents. They're plasticizers for cellulosic plastics. Um, they're used um, in uh, fragrance products. There's some sort of a, a, a carrier or fixative or something uh, that's mixed in with fragrances. Um, skipping down to the, the long chain or high weight ones, uh, diisononyl phthalate, diisodecyl phthalate, these are used exclusively uh, as PVC plasticizers. The in between ones, the transitional ones, dibutyl, uh, butyl benzyl, uh, are used uh, for a little bit of. Uh, 
a little bit of everything. They can be solvents, they can be plasticizers. I'm a, a little puzzled why they class, consider DEHP to be a transitional phthalate. I thought it was more like a, more uh, like DINP and DIDP. Um, um, perhaps there are other, other schemes that uh, classify it just a little bit differently. Um, also, when we're talking about phthalates, there are some things we need to keep in mind. Uh, there are branched and linear phthalates. Uh, the, uh, the alcohol groups or the alcohol groups, uh, the side chains, uh, of course, determine the different phthalates. Now, unlike what we learned in organic chemistry, for the alcohols that have more than six carbon atoms, the prefix iso uh, doesn't mean uh, a methyl group at the second to last carbon atom in, in an otherwise straight chain. It means that these are mixtures of isomers uh, with uh, uh, different branching. And so the isoalcohols and the, the isophthalates, diisonal, diisodecil, are complex substances. They consist of a mixture of, of many different isomers with different branching pattern, patterns. Uh, not only that, they can be made by different processes. So DINP and DIDP have at least two cast numbers each corresponding to different processes. Uh, the uh, product made by the different processes it's, are considered interchangeable. They can be used for all the same things, uh, and, but they, uh, the mix of isomers is a little bit different. Um, you can even have different chain lengths. Uh, one form of DINP is described as C9 rich. In other words, it's mostly known, but there's some eight carbons and 10 carbon uh, uh, chains uh, that are present as well. So we need to keep in mind that, you know, DINP is not one chemical, it's a mixture. Also, uh, the commercial products might not be pure. Uh, the linear alcohols, for example, or the linear phthalates could have uh, significant amounts of branch chain um, impurities, you know, 10, 20 percent or something, and vice versa. So uh, it, 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 it's helpful to, to keep in mind uh, that these aren't, you know, pure compounds that we're necessarily used to working with in a, in a research lab. Now, by and large, the phthalates are uh, metabolized, absorbed and metabolized and excreted fairly rapidly. Uh, within about a day, uh, you know, the metabolites uh, in your flu body fluids probably represent the last day's worth of exposure, something like that. Uh, the first step is the, uh, the diester is cleaved uh, actually in the gut when you take it orally, it's cleaved to the monoester. The monoester is the uh, putative, uh, monoester is the putative uh, active metabolite or toxic metabolite. And this happens very rapidly. Uh, this can be cleaved further to give phthalic acid. Uh, the, for the longer change, uh, chain phthalates, things like more than four carbon atoms, can also be uh, oxidized either at the second to last carbon or the last carbon. Uh, so you can have carboxy, hydroxy, and oxometabolites. And finally, these uh, oxidized metabolites can be glucuronidated, there's some mixture of glucuronidated and, and free metabolite. Uh, and depending on the molecular weight, they're, they're excreted uh, uh, in the urine and the feces, but the mix depends on the molecular weight. The higher ones uh, tend to be more excreted more in the feces. Um, the oxidative uh, metabolites 
are important for biomonitoring studies. In the first biomonitoring studies, people measured the monoesters, and that's great for the lower molecular weight phthalates. But for some of the higher molecular weight ones like DEHP, uh, DINP, uh, the, these are the most abundant um, uh, metabolites that are found in urine, um, which is the preferred method for biomonitoring studies. And so some of the early studies lacked sensitivity um, because they weren't considering these. Now, uh, this kind of sums up the toxicology of phthalates in, in, in a slide. Uh, by and large, they're not acutely toxic. Most of them have LD50s over 5,000 milligrams per kilogram. They're uh, mild to, to non-skin and eye irritants, uh, generally not a lot of sensitization, although there be, have been some reports, I suppose. Uh, and they're not genotoxic in any conventional uh, bioassay in vivo, in vitro, uh, bacteria, or eukaryotes. Um, so we're generally concerned about the, the effects in, uh, from uh, chronic health effects, from chronic and subchronic studies. In, the, in uh, subchronic and chronic studies, the liver and the kidney are the most common targets. Uh, one uh, uh, target organs, uh, the testes is actually, uh, it's very much dependent on the structure of the phthalate. Uh, one of the common um, results of phthalate exposure is the activation of PPAR-alpha. PPAR-alpha is a nuclear receptor and uh, transcription regulator. Among other things, it induces in rodents peroxisome proliferation in the liver, uh, cell proliferation, and ultimately liver tumors. Now, PPAR-alpha may be required for some of the th toxic, some of the other toxic effects of, uh, of phthalates. In studies with uh, PPAR-alpha null mice, uh, some of these effects, like the liver and kidney toxicity, occurred, but they occurred later and uh, with uh, less severity. Um, however, it does not appear that PPAR-alpha is necessary for the, um, some of the developmental effects that we're going to talk about. Uh, one of the uh, PPAR-alpha is significant because hum humans have PPAR-alpha and phthalates activate it, but in humans, PPAR-alpha uh, induces a different uh, set of genes than it does in the rodents. Um, there are uh, actually relatively few other tumor sites than the liver, uh, of course, you always see mononuclear cell leukemia in fish or rats, or almost always. Um, in, for some uh, very strong peroxisome proliferators uh, are associated with uh, the so-called tumor triad, which is the liver, pancreas, and testicular germ cells. And uh, you do see, with the, the phthalates are actually very weak peroxisome proliferators uh, compared to, to other compounds. And you do see occasionally some benign testicular tumors, uh, Leydig cell tumors, not germ cell tumors. There were a few uh, pancreatic carcinomas in a couple of the bioassays. Uh, but for the most part, you don't see the, the triad. Uh, and there were, uh, in, with DINP at least, there were some uh, kidney tumors in male rats, which were attributed to alpha-2 microglobulin or 2 euglobulin. Um, and if you look at the studies hard enough, you, I mean, there's an occasional uh, site where you see uh, some tumors or some hyperplasia. But for the most part, it's, it's the, the liver tumors uh, 
that are the most common, but not see, by no means seen with all of the phthalates. And uh, I, what people are most concerned about and what has gotten the most attention is the reproductive and developmental effects. And this includes uh, various kinds of, uh, of effects, uh, variations, uh, malformations in the ske uh, skeleton, in the viscera, uh, as well as uh, effects on the de male development, depending on the, the time of exposure, the window during prenatal exposure. Um, this slide shows the, um, sums up the data for the six phthalates that are mentioned in the CPSIA, plus dimethyl and diethyl, two low molecular weight ones. And the, just the point I want to make here is the liver in, is a common to all of these. The kidney is the next most common. Um, and this may be significant from the standpoint of a, uh, a cumulative risk assessment. Uh, the testes are a target only for particular ones. Uh, peroxisome proliferation is also not universal. Um, there are uh, re reproductive effects have been shown for some, but, but not all of them. Uh, developmental effects, and in this case I'm lumping everything together, all the kinds of developmental effects. Uh, they are, are common, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, the diethyl here, the little plus or minus, I, I think there was some uh, uh, reduced pup weights or something. Uh, this was not the, the kind of malformations you see with some of the other phthalates. Uh, none of them is genotoxic, and actually, so I, uh, on this list, only two, of course, they all haven't been tested, but I was a little bit surprised that only two of them uh, had uh, uh, tumors associated with them. I expected to see more carcinogenicity, I think. Uh, I'm going to skip this, and this is just to illustrate, this is peroxisome proliferation uh, in vivo, and for various phthalates, this is increasing molecular weight. So is dibutyl phthalate, benzylbutyl phthalate are pretty weak. Uh, DEHP, DINP, uh, branched ones in DIDP, which are branched uh, phthalates, are relatively strong. Uh, 610, 711 and diandesyl, these are linear phthalates, and they're pretty weak. Uh, 610 means uh, 6 to 10 carbon atoms, like a mixture of 6, 8, and 10. This is like a mixture of 7, 9, and 11, and this is diandesyl, so uh, 11 carbon atoms. Um, and they're relatively weak, so not everything is a peroxisome pearl proliferator. Not everything causes liver tumors. Uh, and, of course, uh, this is the, the real reason why we're here, why people are co so concerned about uh, phthalates, because of the, uh, what some people call uh, endocrine disruption. You can call it developmental uh, toxicity or, um, and so on. Uh, but this is the, the phthalate syndrome, in, which is described in uh, rodents. Um, certain phthalates uh, inhibit testosterone production. And this has a number of effects. Uh, the most profound effects are in male pups exposed during late gestation, uh, what some people have termed perinatal exposure. Uh, they expose from late gestation into lactation. And uh, so the, the results uh, or the, the effects of this uh, include uh, reduced anogenital distance, uh, nipple retention, uh, undescended testes, and hypospadias. So there's a range from uh, 
uh, subtle effects to uh, frank malformations. Um, and while the, uh, male the male fetus is the most sensitive, ju uh, they are uh, juvenile males are also sensitive, uh, more sensitive than adult males. Uh, but enough exposure, even adult males are sensitive, uh, uh, high enough exposure for a long enough period of time. Um, and there are effects in the, in the female uh, fetus as well. There can be malformations. Uh, there can be, uh, um, in at least one study, uh, when they mature, there were uh, behavioral effects. Uh, so, uh, but the point, point here is that the male pups are the most profoundly affected. The structure activity relationship is pretty specific. Uh, this is caused by phthal uh, phthalates, linear phthalates having three to six carbon atoms, or, and there's a number of branching, uh, uh, branched ones like the EHP. So the conclusion, well, whether it means it's because it's branching at the C2 position or maybe it's because of the branching, it looks like, a, you know, a, a butyl or a, or a hexyl as opposed to a, an octal. Um, and, of course, the, what's really has us concerned is that if you expose the animals to multiple phthalates, multiple active ones, the effects are additive. I mean, one report they're even uh, synergistic, uh, but the point is there's a cumulative risk from exposure to these phthalates. And it's not even just the phthalates. Uh, cumulative exposure to other uh, uh, compounds that inhibit testosterone production, even if they have a different mode of action. The, um, the phthalates are um, anti-androgens. Some people think they're est synthetic estrogens. They're not. They block uh, the ability of the testes to produce, to, they block the synthesis of, uh, of uh, testosterone. Um, there are some other compounds, uh, flutamide and so on, that have a different, they're, they block, actually block the receptor. Uh, they have a different mode of action, but these other compounds are still uh, act in concert with the, with the phthalates. And this is just a, a, a summary of the active and inactive compounds. Active ones, uh, Propyl, butyl, pentyl, and hexyl. Uh, also, some of the isomeric ones, uh, butyl benzyl, DEHP. Uh, diisononal is active, but it's less potent than the others. It's a mixture of, presumably, it's because it's a mixture of isomers, and some of the isomers are active, probably some aren't. Um, uh, inactive, uh, anything. You know, dimethyl, diethyl, uh, too short, dienheptyl is too long. Uh, Di-T-butyl is not active. Uh, apparently doesn't fit the, the receptor, whatever the receptor is. Uh, and fortunately, the other phthalates, the other isomers, the tera or para isomer, the isophthalates are not active as well. Um, there have been a few uh, epidemiological studies uh, on phthalates that have been published. Most of these uh, involve some uh, comparing the health effects to some sort of biomonitoring uh, data. Um, they've looked at a variety of endpoints like uh, effects on semen, quality, um, Swan, of course, looked at reduced anogenital distance um, in uh, male infants uh, and so on. Uh, people have looked at Maine, looked, oh, Maine looked at uh, hormone levels in males that were uh, exposed uh, via lactation. 
Um, there's one on reduced birth weight, and I think there's since been at least one that looked at exposures, uh, excuse me, that looked at behavior. Um, and uh, finally, I guess I, there, there is one that I forgot to put in uh, that's not here on the slide, but it's uh, looked at uh, the ability of phthalates like DEHP and DINP and house dust, uh, the association with um, asthma. Now, um, most of these studies, um, uh, they're looking at correlations between exposures and certain health effects. One of the problems, one of the confounding factors is, well, A, we're all exposed, and we're all exposed to multiple phthalates. So uh, not to mention we're exposed to lots of other chemicals, um, some of which may uh, also have similar effects. So generally what you're seeing in these studies is, is some correlations. They're very suggestive, but there's no causal uh, no causal link as yet. And one of the, uh, the puzzling uh, factors uh, about these studies is sometimes the strongest associations are seen with diethyl and dimethyl, and they are the ones that are not active in the animals. I mean, maybe people are different, I don't know. Uh, but that's a little bit of a puzzle, and sometimes you don't see an association with uh, the active ones like DEHP or DINP. Um, but the work continues. I understand that some uh, uh, Dr. Hauser and some of his colleagues are working on um, alternate study designs, case control type designs that might be able to uh, uh, shed more light on this. Um, one of the important developments in the last 10 years has been uh, the availability of biomonitoring data. Uh, urinary metabolites um, are preferred, uh, are the preferred method uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's not invasive, it's relatively inexpensive, and uh, also because you're measuring metabolites, uh, and phthalates are ubiquitous, they're present in labware and flooring and so on, so that uh, reduces your concern about contamination by if you're measuring the phthalate as opposed to the parent compound. Um, we have pretty good data for the general population, and there are methods for estimating uh, exposure from the metabolite levels. Um, unfortunately, the, the data for infants, children uh, uh, three and under, uh, and expectant mothers are limited. There are some data. There's not a great deal. Um, uh, and. Um, as Paul alluded to, the Dr. Loy, uh, the National Children's Study is, uh, among other things, will obtain data, uh, biomonitoring data, urinary metabolites um, from children and their mothers, basically from conception through uh, childhood. And some of the people involved with the study have told me that there's a chance that some of those data will be available in time for the the chap to take advantage of. We, you know, that remains to be seen, but uh, we're hopeful. Um, anyway, so far, uh, 10, the metabolites from 10 different phthalates have been identified, uh, and uh, that includes, uh, I think, 21 or 22 metabolites at least. Uh, the uh, uh, NHANES is ongoing. There's a new set of data that's out that needs to be um, analyzed and, and so on. Um, and there are biomonitoring studies going on in, in a lot of other countries, including Canada and Europe, um, and probably others. Um, as far as sor sources of exposure, identifying the particular sources and pathways is a little more diffi difficult. I mean, biomonitoring tells you, uh, it is very good for telling you what the total exposure is. Uh, for the most part, people have uh, thought that food is the major source of exposure for most phthalates. Uh, but I think, you know, the more I look at the exposure data, I think the, the harder it is to really uh, pin this down. Um, phthalates in food, they could be in the food itself, 
uh, uh, during growth. Uh, it, it, they're mostly in uh, fatty foods, meat and dairy products. It can come from processing, it can come from packaging. The people at the FDA and the, and the people who make phthalates, the manufacturers, uh, say that in the United States, uh, PVC and phthalates are not used a lot in food packaging. So that leaves background, general background exposure and perhaps food processing as the major sources, but um, really the food can be contaminated at almost any stage. It can be contaminated sitting on, on, your, uh, on your table at home. Uh, personal care products can have lower molecular weight uh, phthalates, uh, mainly ethyl and butyl. Uh, there are medical devices that contain DEHP, and uh, this affects, can affect a, a, a narrow uh, subpopulation of people, uh, people undergoing major medical procedures and, uh, or kidney dialysis. Uh, there's a lot of vinyl in automobile interiors. They're in consumer products, home furnishings, uh, fragrance products, uh, children's products, although obviously that's changing. Um, we can also be exposed from the environment. Uh, that includes household dust. Household dust uh, is a magnet for semi-volatile compounds and other pollutants. And that can be a significant source of exposure or pathway of exposure, especially for children. Um, it's not entirely clear how it gets from the products to the dust um, and uh, what the factors are that affect that. Um, so about 10 o'clock and um, I'm wondering if we might want to pause to take a little break. Bern, you have a question? What about the presence of phthalates and their metabolites in here? Well, they're, they're present everywhere. I mean, they're present in human milk and cow's milk. Uh, in uh, milk, you sometimes uh, see not just the metabol. I'm not sure why. You see metabolites and you see some parent compound. So I'm not sure what's happening there, if that's because of some source of contamination, because um, you would expect, uh, at least from oral exposure, uh, the mother, for example, you, you would expect it to be metabolized first. So that's a little bit of a puzzle. Primarily looking for is whether or not uh, secretion into milk and therefore you might have more in milk lipids than you would have in other foods that don't have milk in them well I th I think you it I, I'm not sure I mean they de they're hydrophobic so they they definitely have an affinity for fatty foods um, uh, as far as I can tell uh, 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 that that's the main determining factor I don't know if there's any other kind of facility transport I know some people have looked at pharmacokinetics, uh, there may be an answer in the literature, but I'm, I don't, I'm not aware of it. Paul? Um, since I'm a novice to this area, um, I did a lot of background reading, um, and I'm a little puzzled by your, your, your summary talk, because a lot of the things that you've been worried about has been the issue of behavior and activities and the uncertainties associated with it and I see nothing here discussing it I see the sort I see, see the same old stuff sources epidemiology and toxicology where in this particular instance as well as other instances the behavior of the child is so important in terms of where they're contacting the material and how they're contacting it and I would like to at least hear at some point a little bit of discussion about where you are, what you learned, and what some of the uncertainties are, because it's clear, to me at least, that you have some of it right, but there are some other issues that remain. Um, and on the household dust, the issue of sources, there, you know, Charlie Wessler of um, 
our place and, and myself, uh, Charlie could give you a really good summary of the fact that it's the um, grasshopper effect in the house that moves the phthalates from the toys and whatever to the dust and then goes back to the, the air to back to the dust over time. But I'm mostly concerned about this fact that there's a disconnect still with behavior and activities because to me that's crucial in terms of getting the exposure which leads to the dose and whatever biomarker levels we're going to be measuring. Well, I think that in terms of uh, the children's behavior, mouthing behavior, we have done some work on that. And I could, uh, after the break, bring up a, a few more slides and talk a little bit more about that. I, I sure. Think that, to me, that's important because I don't want to lose that because it's clear that you recognize it. It's, I want to make sure we don't lose that as part of the discussion. Okay, I'll explain, expand on that a little bit after, uh, after the break. Any other questions or comments? I'm not worried. I'm just trying. Um, why don't we break for about 15 minutes and come back at about 1025, reconvene them? Thank you. Okay, welcome back. Uh, Dr. Loy had asked for a little more detail on some of the exposure assessment work that we had done in the past. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to um, insert a few uh, slides here uh, from some uh, earlier talks uh, to give a little bit more detail, uh, and then we'll get back to our agenda. Um, we're doing pretty well time-wise. This is the work that we had done to assess children's exposure to DINP in products like teethers and soft plastic toys. I've already seen this. Um, our approach uh, to the exposure assessment was this. Uh, we surveyed soft plastic teethers and toys for DINP uh, prevalence and content. We measured the DINP migration rates uh, using a laboratory method. It's a lab method that was calibrated with adult volunteers, and I'll explain this in a little more detail uh, in a minute. Uh, we also did an observation study with 169 children uh, up to 36 months old. And we did a probabilistic analysis of oral exposure uh, stratified by the, the child's age and the type of product. Um, this is the apparatus that was used in the laboratory method. Uh, this was first developed uh, by the Dutch uh, uh, RIVM, uh, their EPA. Uh, they uh, refer to this as the uh, uh, head over heels method because it, you basically tumble um, the, sa the sample. Um, the way it works is you, you cut a little disc of plastic from the toy or the article. You put it in a bottle with a certain amount of... Uh, what could be um, a synthetic saliva or even just a, a saline, solu normal saline, whatever. Uh, we, I think we used phosphate buffered saline. Um, it's rotated, spun around here for, I think it's 30 minutes at 60 RPMs. Um, you collect the, the, um, the liquid, you put fresh liquid in, do it for another 30 minutes. Uh, then when you're all done, you combine the two uh, liquid samples, you uh, measure the amount of DINP uh, or other phthalate, and you calculate a migration rate, which is in dimensions of micrograms per square centimeter per hour, or sometimes we express it as 
micrograms per um, 10 square centimeters per hour, because 10 square centimeters is the size of the disk. It's also the size that most people assume uh, the, the surface area that's in the child's mouth. That's based on the surface area of a, of a pacifier. <clears throat> um, and this just shows for this, the, pro, oh, the products that we tested. This is the percent of DINP, and this is the migration rate, micrograms per, twer, per 10 square centimeters. Oh, this is per minute. Um, and what this shows is there, there's a lot of noise. Uh, you, you can't really predict the migration rate uh, just based on the DINP content, uh, you know, regardless of fixed law. I think that there are just other factors such as um, there are different methods for making the products, molding and spinning and all this stuff. There are sheets. Uh, there are other compounds present, colorants and so on. So there are just probably other factors that we're not controlling for. Um, the hope was that you'd, you'd be able to say, look, if you're below a, a certain percentage, you know, you're at a, uh, uh, an acceptable dose. Uh, but it didn't work out that way. Um, the, the method was developed by the D Dutch, and actually what they did is they first did some studies with adult volunteers, and then they developed a method that um, would give the same migration rate in in uh, vitro as the one with the volunteer studies. Now, uh, a, a, when we started this in 1998, uh, people, uh, every country's uh, EPA or CPSC laboratory had their own method for measuring migration. There were widely different results, um, but no one tested the same product. And, when we tried, I mean, we, you couldn't replicate the other guy's results. Um, and, um, you know, our, people tried all sorts of crazy things, usually a combination of a liquid extraction and some mechanical action. We actually had a pneumatic piston <clears throat> that basically chewed the sample. Uh, we found out later that that was badly underestimating exposure. Um, I think Canada had a, a actually like false teeth chewing on it. Uh, <clears throat> in the UK, they tried putting steel balls in while they shook it around in a flask, but the steel balls went through the side of the flask. <clears throat> but the judge came up with this, and it, it, it closely matched the rates that they saw with the adult volunteers. The only problem is, they didn't have a, a big range of products in a big range of rates, uh, but at least that average, uh, the correlation for the average kind of product was there. And so that's the one that everyone ad ad adopted. Um, and anyway, these were calibrated with the uh, uh, adult volunteers. In a, a typical study, you have 10 people, you get a 10 square centimeter PV disc, PVC disc, uh, mouth, on, mouth it for a total of an hour. That's four 15-minute sessions where you collect all your saliva. Um, and people had, and there was, a, in, in, most people had in there a 15-minute uh, exposure to a, a blank. Um, there was a standard disc that, uh, the people in Europe had made up, that contained 40% DINP. Or you could use a sample cut from a toy. Um, anyway, you collect the saliva, analyze for DINP, and calculate the migration rate. Let's see. What do we have here? These are the, the results from a number of different studies. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, a, a frequency distribution. This is the relative migration rate. Um, I divided by the uh, that migration rate for individuals by the average migration rate. Um, so all the studies would be on the same scale. They're really not that uniform. Uh, and this is the percentage of the of the the people in the study, either ten or 
they had ends of either 10 or 20. And this just happens, we have three from the Dutch because they uh, shared their uh, raw data with us in, in one of our own studies, which was a, a sample, actually, a rubber ducky. Um, and as you can see, it's, it looks pretty much log normal, and it's, it's definitely skewed. And there's always, you know, one person who's, who's way out there. Uh, but these are adults. Their instructions were to, to gently mouth, suck, and chew. So, you know, there, there, there's always someone who, like, you don't get a sample back at the end. But <laughs> for the most part, uh, that's the real kid. It approximated <laughs> what children do. And of course, you worry about things like, well, they're adults, they could probably apply more pressure than a child. Um, but there's nothing we can do about that. And plus, I'm not convinced that that's true. Also, uh, you know, some DIMP could be absorbed through the, um, the lining of the mouth. Uh, we did some calculations to convince ourselves that that was not significant. Uh, we also, uh, I mean, there's a possibility that you could swallow, they could swallow some of it. But anyway, it, it, this is in, it was important to us because the method we had been using and the one we used in the DEHP chap was way underestimating exposure. So to have this kind of validation is, is uh, we were very fortunate to have this. Now, so what did we find? Uh, 42% of the toys that we tested contained DINP. Now remember, in 1998, the manufacturers voluntarily took phthalates out of teethers, and, and they weren't in pat teethers and rattles. They weren't in pacifiers. And in fact, by then, instead of 90% of the toys um, having DINP, we were down to less than half. Uh, we had a migration rate. Uh, migration rate didn't depend very well on the DINP content. Um, from the Dutch study, because uh, they had uh, good, good data, uh, with the PVC standard disk, uh, we, we took their data. They had an N of 19, um, and we also had uh, that same standard disk measured in a laboratory. And what we did is we calibrated it this way. The, when they designed the method, they were actually calibrating the lab method so that it would correspond to a, like a 90th percentile migration rate. We wanted to do the actual average, but then include all the variability. Um, so what we had was, you know, 19 measurements or measurements from 19 volunteers, uh, measurements with in the lab with five standard disks. And so we had an average ratio of 0.28, uh, you know, plus or minus all this variability. Now, the observation study, um, 169 children, 3 to 36 months old. They were randomly selected in Chicago and Houston. This was some sort of random dialing thing, and it's, you know, it's not easy to recruit uh, <coughs> infants into a, a study by just getting on the phone and calling people. Uh, we had trained observers. Some of the early, actually, you know, the Dutch had done a study like this uh, where they had the parents collect the data. We had trained observers. Uh, we thought that that was better because, you know, mothers are busy multitasking. Um, we had 12 20-minute sessions over a two-day period, wherever the child was, at home or daycare, whatever. Uh, we wrote down everything they mouthed, the frequency and the duration of mouthing. Um, we did have, because our observers weren't there the whole time, the parents recorded, recorded the time that the child was awake and not eating. Uh, because for, you know, that way you can extrapolate from the, the observations, the samples, to a whole day's worth of mouthing activity. And this was very much dependent on the, the 
the child's uh, age and months as you could imagine. And of course, for some of these kids, they're only awake, you know, maybe half the day. Um, very briefly, what we found, average uh, daily mouthing time, this is in minutes per day. Uh, four, all except pacifiers, 70 minutes per day uh, in the youngest group in slowly declining with age. Uh, the, the window for m mouthing is pretty much peaks in this age range. Over 36 months, it starts to decline. Um, soft plastic teethers and rattles. Um, here, less than two minutes a day. Here, a fraction of a minute to, per day. Soft plastic toys, uh, you know, on the order of a minute per day. Um, the way they did the study, I mean, we have a database, if I understand it correctly, Michael, um, where you can go through and, and, and uh, arrange the data and all sample it in all different kinds of ways. I mean, if you want to look at blue toys versus green toys, you could probably do that. I don't know. Um, um, but what we found is that mouthing is intermittent. The, these totals are short. They actually may represent many events. And we considered mouthing to be any time the toy touches the child's lips not necessarily even in the mouth. Um, uh, another thing that we did a little bit different from other studies, uh, some people used very broad categories like non-pacifiers. I mean, they looked at things like all except pacifiers. Um, we tried to be a little bit more specific to get at the, the products that we were interested in. So that's one reason why some people's mouthing times may be longer than ours because they're actually looking at toys as opposed to soft plastic toys. Um, and this is some more summary data. Uh, this is for soft plastic toys, the rubber duckies, tub toys, squeaky toys. Um, and you can see the mean daily mouthing time goes from, uh, uh, actually in this case, peaks at the, the one to two year olds um, and then declines in the older children. And uh, 95th percentiles here still under 10 minutes. Uh, the medians are actually zero because on a given day, a child might not mouth a, a soft plastic toy mouthing something else. Uh, so to estimate the exposure, uh, we took all of these data. The exposure is the product migration rate determined in the laboratory with the sample of the product. Uh, this is uh, the calibration factor. This is the migration weight uh, rate of the standard disk with humans divided by the standard disk in the lab. This is the number of hours per day that the child is awake and not eating. And this is, uh, or is it, do I have it backwards? This is the mouthing time in minutes per hour that the child mouths a particular kind of toy. And this is the time the child is awake, not eating, divided by the body weight. And all of these, well, all of these things are, um, sets of data. I mean, we have multiple measurements with the product. Um, in fact, for the, the basic case where, because we know that 40% of the toys had DINP, we actually included uh, a number of zeros to account for that. We had all, you know, 19 uh, uh, migration rates with the humans, five from the lab, um, and of course, all these represent all the subjects in the study, except that they're stratified by the age of the child. Um, and uh, these are stratified by the, well, not really. The, the, the mouthing times are stratified by the age of the child, um, these things, and the type, the product category you're looking at. And that's the body weight. We had essentially distributions of all of these things. 
So you go through this Monte Carlo type of, of thing, which is, you know, random except where it depends on the age, the exposure time, the mouth time, and so on, body weight. And so this is what we got. The INP exposures from soft plastic toys, uh, very low on the order of a, a microgram, not even a microgram per kilogram per day. These are means, uh, upper bounds, uh, the, the errors, the ranges here, confidence intervals represent the um, repeated sampling of the, of the data. Uh, this is the 95th percentile, and we even did the 99th percentile just because we could, and these were all lower than our acceptable daily intake. Um, so let's see, and th this represents soft plastic toys where 42% of them contain DINP. Um, since we call this the hypothetical case because teethers, rattles, and so on no longer contained any phthalates. So we just used the migration rates from soft plastic toys and, and applied them to teethers and rattles. There was no reason to think they would be different in assuming that they all contain DINP. So this is basically if the industry went back and put DINP back into all of these toys, which they voluntarily removed, and still the, uh, even the upper bound exposures were low. And I think that was the, that's the highlights. Um, the, uh, we applied migration r rates from toys to other products. I think that's not much of a stretch. Assume that absorption through the oral mucosa is negligible. Um, we didn't, in this case, we didn't look at dermal, although that's, you know, dermal is, we think it's low, uh, it's not zero. Uh, limitations, there's lots of variability. Um, and of course, the bottom line is we looked at one phthalate, one class of products. Um, but uh, let's see, and well, this is where we are today. We have the chronic adv advisory panel to take us uh, one step further. Um, and I think that that sums up the exposure assessment that we did for DINP um, as relates to uh, the children's mouthing behavior. Yes. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, how does that intake compare to intake via food? Well, I mean, we didn't do that compare. You know, we only looked at one route. Um, the food, uh, it, it's not so easy to determine, um, uh, as we learned in, uh, in Berlin a few, uh, about a month ago, uh, it, you know, there, there are lots of different foods. You test all these things and you get non-detects and it's hard to go from, uh, like a market basket survey to estimate an exposure. I mean, you know, there are people who do this and, um, are experts at this, uh, I, you know, we think that this is low compared to total exposure. And we think that food is where most of your phthalate exposure comes from. Um, oh. But I don't know, well, see, w we've been focused on, you know, DINP and DEHP in just these few products. It's only the, since uh, uh, a year or two ago that we've, broaden this scope. But the more I look at the literature, the less convinced I am that the generalizations, like most of our exposure comes from food, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. And, and one, one aspect of that is the fact that it may be incidental contact with the food on counters, which also would indicate to me that that's incidental contact with the children's hands on counters because it's not just during food preparation, it's also the fact that you have children waltzing around the house and with the grasshopper effect totally in play, you can end up with kids mouthing a lot of stuff from a lot of different places. It doesn't mean that the exposures are high, it's just that I don't think at this point it would be reasonable to discount any roots 
because I don't think we know a good answer. Could, could you just explain those grasshoppers in UK and US houses to us non-US <laughs> members on the panel? What is the grasshopper effect? <laughs> well, it actually was created in Canada, but, that's, but that was for outdoors. Basically what happens in a home, you have sources of all kinds of semi-volatile materials. And the first, the first time we really looked at it was with pesticides. Pesticides, when they're sprayed on the floor, um, for the, for the semi-volatiles, uh, you know, you, you spray it, and it used to be the raid commercials, and they'll follow the, you know, the bugs to where they live, meaning that once it's sprayed, it's semi-volatile, so therefore at the temperatures that the house is in, the material is going to evaporate, and it's going to stay a while, around a while, and it's going to follow the bugs. So that's, so the grasshopper effect is that, when it's sprayed, it goes in a certain spot, but because of the temperatures of the room, it'll semi, there'll be semi-volatilization. Uh, if the room cools or the air currents are being what they are and you have absorbable material like this, well, it acts like a sink for the pesticide or other semi-volatiles, so it'll go here. Doesn't mean it was sprayed there initially, but it'll come there. And then as time goes on, it'll evaporate, go into other parts of the house, and eventually go out the window. Over time, everything goes down. Grasshopper has landed. Yes, and so when you think about it in terms of any, any semi-volatile, that is an issue, and when you're thinking about anything that gets sprayed in a house and lands on this kitchen table, well, that could be, you know, something. It's, it's same, the same sort of thing. It's not just phthalates. It's anything that's semi-volatile. Anything that you use can be some, it can be transport. The question is, is how much, how long, and what it has to deal with, what, what the issue is in terms of the dose that leads to the, the associated toxicity. Because you just can't assume because it accumulates you're going to get sufficient amount for a dose that's meaningful for a particular toxic effect. It's just that putting that all into the equation gives you a better understanding of what the issue is. Thanks for that. In, 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 in that uh, to expand a little bit, um, it all sorts of kind of flame retardants, all yes. sorts of pollutants. You, you find them on surfaces, they find them on window film, they find them in the dust particles. And I, I, I look at the, the dust particles are a pathway. They're not a source, really, because um, they, they get there from a variety of different sources. It's called approximate source. Yeah, approximate source. And uh, so... Um, you know, when you uh, that also complicates. You know, uh, uh, there there's some publications, uh, a Warmoth, uh, where they try to break down. You know, you get this percentage from food, this percentage from toys, and and the problem is when you get the dust. I mean, that's coming from everywhere. So these aren't all mutually exclusive sources. So that that further complicates the issue. Um, could could I ask another question? So um, I realized that on these studies you were doing, you were focusing on the DINP part. Yes. Uh, how representative is the DINP of, of, for other phthalates? So when you say it's a, a low level of DINP, but there are multiple phthalates, is it a reasonable approximation to multiply that by the number of phthalates? Well, I, I mean, think that's hard. That's hard to do uh, because the, the potencies aren't the same. I mean, toxicologically, the potencies aren't the same. DINP is one of the less volatile, more hydrophobic ones, so the exposure is going to be a little bit different. Uh, it's probably very behaves very comparably to DIDP, maybe even DEHP, but the lower molecular weight ones are, I think, a whole different ball game. Um, the exposure patterns are going to be different, um, and the you know the data. Uh, well, with the biomonitoring, the first studies um, didn't detect much DINP because they were only looking for the monoester. Um, I, I need to, I, I'm not sure, I mean, DINP exposures um, were thought to be relatively low compared to some of the other phthalates. But this can change over time. You know, one of the, the important things, uh, there are two things uh, that to keep in mind about when you look at exposures. One is things change over time. DINP is slowly replacing DEHP um, uh, worldwide. 
Um, so things change, and the products change. Obviously, they're taking phthalates out of children's products. Um, they may be reformulating uh, some of the drugs uh, that have phthalates in the, you know, the time-release formulas, um, I suspect, um, and so on. Um, uh, the other thing is that things can vary by region. I, th you know, the, mm -hmm. the the phthalates that are used in a particular kind of product in Europe might not be entirely the same as the U.S. The overall exposures are fairly comparable, but I don't think they're the same. Um, so, uh, you know, those are my two caveats for looking at exposure data. What about personal care products and children? Oh, God. You know, that's something we don't know a lot about. Yeah. There's been some studies, um, a couple reports in the literature where people, obviously, the um, phthalates are there. Um, it's surprising. Um, the FDA says that it's, they're not all that common. A, they're not all that common. And B, that they're already reformulating. Um, <clears throat> Personal care products, things like skin lotions, baby lotion, um, and uh, that sort of thing. Colognes um, have that, have some of the lower molecular weight phthalates. Um, FDA says that they're already encouraging the manufacturers, and the manufacturers are reformulating these things. The 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 low molecular weight phthalates are in a lot of fragranced products. They can be in air fresheners. They might even be. I've heard laundry detergent. The problem is we don't we don't really know. I mean, if it's a consumer product, they don't the manufacturers don't have to tell us what's what's in it. Um, even for um, cosmetics, uh, you know, it's not like a drug. Uh, FDA has a, a less control over that. Um, um, so we will get whatever kind of information they have. We will get that for the chat, but. Um, I, I, I don't think it's going to be as comprehensive as you might expect. While we're at various exposure sources, what about drugs? Phthalates are used uh, surprisingly widely in the uh, formulation of drugs. Yeah, well, again, I'm not sure. The FDA says not so widely. Um, and... Uh, also, uh, but they are used in some drugs, and again, that's something that may change, but we will get whatever information the FDA can provide on that. Now, it's an issue where, you know, maybe an issue where it, it, the, the inert materials, uh, mm -hmm. maybe, I, I don't know if they have to dis fully disclose that. We will, I'll get the, the bottom line from them. I, d I d wasn't aware they were that widely used, but I don't know. By butyl phthalate and diethylate is an inactive ingredient in the medications. The same thing. And the, same uh, thing. Right. the second question is widely used. Well, uh, currently in Germany, that's what I can say, there are 25 medications which still have dibutyl phthalate in it. Yeah. Uh, in the past, it has been around 65. Unluckily, uh, one of the most widely used medications uh, did use dibutyl phthalate. It was used by over 5 million people per year, including pregnant women. So um, we have to get away from these relative uh, numbers and uh, really have to look at what, uh, what is the real use. I would like to come back to your slide number 12 and 14. Um, in slide number 12, I, I, I didn't really... So, all except pacifiers means that the children's children mouth 70 minutes. Yeah, that includes uh, everything, including their fingers. Yes, so we have a gap of 68 minutes, which where they use uh, mouth something different than soft plastic teethers and soft plastic toys. And um, I, if... The, the, the order is, um, I think, fingers were most, then pacifiers, yes. and then uh, teethers. And then this and then unintent else. unintentional use for the kids, like mouthing cables. The, those things are, 
I mean, they're scattered around. They're there, but you see, you know, one here, one there. It's not consistent. Okay. It's, you know, the average for mouthing on a chair leg is, you know, probably infinitesimal. There are uh, children also mouth toys that were not made out of soft plastic, wooden toys, metal toys, that sort of thing. Just about everything. So in slide 14, in, in slide 14, 14 um, this factor, does it mean that the machinery overestimates exposure or underestimates exposure? This factor of 0.28? Well, well, yeah, the, the Dutch uh, who developed it and then later the JRC um, designed it in such a way that it would overestimate the average. They were aiming for the upper, an upper bound migration rate mm. in the human studies. We decided to calculate the, the average, but then um, through the Monte Carlo modeling, look at the range of, of values. Did you correct for lipase activity in the human saliva, like degradation of the diisononal phthalates? Uh, no, we didn't. Because there is lipase activity in yeah. human saliva, you would have a degradation in the saliva, so this would lead to an underestimation, although you still have the active compound in the saliva. And, and I would need, well, I need to look at the, exactly what the lab did and whether they would have detected that. Mm -hmm. um, they, they may likely thought of that, but... Never can be sure of. Yeah, but we can go back and look. Can I ask another question? Um, maybe we're getting too far off the track. But no, no. Just in terms of inhalation, I mean, you start, start talking about house dust. It seems yeah. like if I, Russ may know a paper, I thought I read about a paper that had, a, I think it was PBDEs and um, breast milk, and um, based on the rate of uh, the times their houses were vacuumed or something. Um, so I mean, it seems like exposure could increase. Based I, on I the think clint. if you do anything to stir up the dust, like cleaning, ironically, uh, you could have a short term. I think we're, we're you know, t I guess we're talking about chronic to effects. We're mostly talking about long term exposures. Um, but, uh, uh, but I mean, ha have there been studies about inhalation exposure to phthalates? Well, is the, the problem is the vapor pressure is so low. There are a, a few measurements of levels in ambient and indoor air but the vapor pressure is so low. Most of it's bound to particles, and most of those particles probably settled on the floor. Um, um, so yes, there's inhalation exposure. No, uh, we don't think it's that high. Well, um, it's unquantified. It's we, unquantified. That's better to describe it because the rug rats love the floor, yeah. and they, when they move along, they stir up dust um, that is maybe four times the average level of resuspended dust in the room when you're just sitting there. Uh, these are studies have been done recently with a robot, with a robot that, that mimics children's behavior on the floor. And so, you know, I think the best thing to say it's unquantified, and, and it's a good point that if we're going to do this right, we really have to think about what this what the different exposure yeah and, and in fact w with the dust even if it's inhaled mm -hmm. it, I mean it probably ends up in the in the gut anyway as opposed to in the lungs or most of it um, but you know uh, this is why we have the experts because I um, at a loss for something that that's so non-volatile um, you know that's not easy to estimate so um, um, certainly, that those are points well taken. But is part of our charge to think about this in terms of products like toys, or are we are we thinking about this more generally in terms of just general exposures that could come from all kinds of products, but exposure? Yeah. Well, I think you know the charge is is next on our agenda, and I think the the way I see it, you're focusing on children's products, the toys and other childcare things, but you also and doing that, knowing that children and everybody else are exposed from all these other sources. And in fact, it's the cumulative exposure that is going to determine the risk. Right. So we have to do a little bit of both. Um,
if we can get back on, uh, let's see. My talk here. Oh, probably already open. And move on to, uh, let's talk about the, the charge and scope of this chap. Um, in, in general, the uh, sort of, uh, the rules for conducting a chap are outlined in the Consumer Product Safety Act. <clears throat> We're required, in fact, to convene a CHAP under, normally, we have to convene a CHAP if we want to issue a regulation that's based on a risk of cancer, birth defects, or gene mutations. Um, uh, this is, uh, you could call this an extraordinary CHAP because it's mandated by Congress. Uh, a, a CHAP consists, uh, by law, consists of seven independent scientists. Uh, the commission selects them from a list of nominees that comes from the president of the National Academy of Sciences. In addition to uh, possessing the required expertise, um, they have to be people who are not employed by the federal government uh, except NIH, the National Toxicology Program, or the National Center for Toxolo Toxicological Research. Uh, also, they can't be associated with the manufacturer. So in this case, manufacturer of mainly phthalates or children's products. Um, and that the members of the panel select a chair and a vice chair. Um, for this uh, particular chap to uh, um, sum up the charge, uh, the mandate from Congress is that you uh, conduct a risk assessment looking at all phthalates used in children's products. Um, and that include, and that you are to include all potential health effects on children's health, uh, specifically including endocrine disruption. Um, that you are to consider individual and cumulative risks. Uh, in other words, I think the individual phthalates as well as cumulative risks. Um, you're supposed to estimate exposure to children, pregnant women, and others. I think others means if there are any other sensitive subpopulations. I'm not aware of any. Um, and we're supposed to look at total phthalate exposure from children's products, personal care products, and all other sources. Um, and you are to consider all routes of exposure, in other words, not just mouthing, um, thermal inhalation, whatever. Um, and as part of this examination, you're supposed to determine a level of no harm to children, pregnant women, other susceptible individuals, their offspring, and to do this using appropriate safety factors. Um, you're also to consider alternatives used in children's, uh, phthalate alternatives used in children's products. Um, obviously, phthalates, in, um, when manufacturers take phthalates out of, product, uh, of a product, they have two options. One is to use another plastic that doesn't need a plasticizer. Some of them do that. Some of the other option is to replace the phthalate with another plasticizer, like an adipate or something like that. So you're lo looking at the phthalate alternatives, which I uh, interpret as the, the uh, other plasticizers. Um, and that your examination is to be conducted de novo using all available information and objective methods. I, uh, Part of the, the language, the specific language about de novo says that, you know, you can, you can consider 
uh, work done by previous JAPs and other bodies. But it's, uh, you're not restrict, you don't have to um, uh, accept those conclusions. You're free to go back and revisit anything that you want to do. Um, and um, your report will include a recommendation whether to ban any additional phthalates or phthalate alternatives. Um, once that report is issued, the staff will evaluate your report and recommend to the commission whether to ban any other phthalates or phthalate alternatives and also whether to make the interim ban permanent, the three phthalates that are banned on an interim basis, DINP, DIDP, and DNOP. Um, the timeline is such, uh, the way it's written, you have 18 months to complete your examination, but you have another six months to prepare a final report. I mean, I s see this as essentially you have two years um, to complete a final report. The two, the examination and the report kind of uh, blend together. Um, and once the final report is complete, we have six months uh, to brief the commission with our recommendations. Now, to prepare for the CHAP, this is a, a, such a large job in such a broad scope. Um, we did uh, toxicity reviews of the six phthalates mentioned in the, in the act. Um, of course, there are other phthalates that are important too. Uh, we thought this would be a good start, and these, uh, these were prepared by the staff, by the people sitting at the table, and myself, and these have been peer-reviewed by outside scientists. Our contractor, Versar, uh, has done a report on the toxicity of five phthalate alternatives. Um, these include uh, acetyl tributyl citrate, uh, diethylhexyl adipate, uh, something called DINCH, uh, DEHT, which is an isomer of DEHP, and this uh, trimelitate, trioctyl trimelitate. And most of these are, in fact, being used in children's products. Uh, Versar also did a, a very comprehensive review of the published exposure data. And when I saw there, I had no idea that, that there was that much. I knew there was. Um, it, it's a, a very extensive report. Um, we also did a, uh, a laboratory study on the plasticizers in children's toys. We collected some uh, toys uh, last uh, December, November, December. Um, we specifically did it before the requirements, the ban actually went into effect. Um, so these were from 2000 and late 2008, I think. Is that correct? Um, and what we found is that, in fact, um, even before the ban was in effect, that very few of these uh, children's articles, toys and child care articles had any phthalates at all. Um, the one that did would be actually comply with the, with, the, with the new regulation. We identified the plasticizers, the concentrations, and measured uh, migration rates by that head over heels method. Uh, we also measured, uh, did some wipes, some uh, to, to get an estimate of exposure uh, as it re would relate to dermal exposure from handling the products. Um, we're also, part of our job is to coordinate with the other federal agencies to get whatever information we can get for you from FDA, uh, information on drugs and cosmetics, uh, CDC, the NHANES. Um, EPA is doing some of their own work on phthalates, and we're going to keep 
close eye on that. Try not to duplicate things too much. Try to take it uh, sort of take advantage of uh, uh, what we do and what what they do, and vice versa. Some of the EPA staff are here today, and of course we're we're anxiously looking forward to the National Children's Study. Uh, as far as the phthalates go, um, of course, the universe of possible phthalates is is huge. It could include, uh, you know, any of the 30 phthalates that are not mentioned in the Act, specifically mentioned. Um, uh, it could also include terephthalates, and in fact, it does. Uh, the toxicity review were th these five. Uh, we arrived at these five. Uh, by a process that's described in the report. First, we consider the entire universe of substitutes uh, that we could identify. There were, what, 20, 30, something like that. Uh, we chose these five because they had a high likelihood of being used, or which means they probably already were, or, and also uh, because there were data, tox data available. Now, the data, uh, if you look at these, uh, the citrate's been around for a while. The adipate has been around for a while. You might notice it's got the same ethyl hexyl, the same alcohol group as DEHP. Um, this, the terephthalate, is the isomer of DEHP. Uh, fortunately, the terephthalates don't seem to have the uh, um, developmental effects uh, that the the orthophthalates have. Uh, this guy, Dinch, uh, diisononal, it's actually made from DINP. It's, uh, the aromatic ring is reduced so that instead of the aromatic ring, you have a cyclohexane group. And this is, in fact, being used. As far as the database goes, um, on these, uh, the toxicity database, it's a little bit uneven. Um, I'm not sure any one of them is, is as well studied as DINP, for example. Uh, this one is interesting. The manufacturer has uh, a lot of toxicity data. They've done a number of studies. Uh, those studies are considered, they consider them to be um, proprietary, and they don't want those studies to be released to the public. Um, all we have are their summaries of their own studies. Um, this is something uh, we, can, we can talk about, uh, how we want to deal with this. Um, the others, uh, well, they're, they're, they're summarized in the report, and we have actually, for most of these, if not all of them, we have migration rates from the laboratory study. Um, in terms of interagency coordination, well, since you're looking at total exposure, this crosses jurisdiction, EPA, uh, I mean, FDA, EPA. Of course, we've got jurisdiction over certain of these products. Uh, we don't have jurisdiction over automobile carriers. Uh, we will certainly monitor everything we can find, uh, data, uh, some of the biomonitoring studies that are going on, um, and we will request uh, all the available data from the other federal agencies. That's my job is to, uh, to stay in touch with them. And uh, with that, uh, um, I think we'll, uh, uh, our job here as the the staff is to give you uh, administrative support, interagency coordination, uh, so as much support as we can in terms of uh, staff time, toxicology, uh, the, whether it's statistics or the lab, uh, mostly my time. Um, our resources are limited, but there is a, also a possibility, depending on what your needs are, of some contractor support. Okay. Uh, we, uh, I, what I wanted to do is we have the studies uh, that we prepared for you. Some of them, they're too big to include in your binders. 
the lab report and uh, is in your binders along with, I did a, just a, a quick overview of phthalates, chemistry and toxicity that's in there. You have a set of CDs that contain all the staff documents that we prepared, um, plus other existing information. The previous CHAP reports, uh, uh, the rep you know, NTP reports and so on. Uh, a lot of background information. Uh, for the people uh, in the audience, the staff reports will be posted on the, our website very soon. Um, the old CHAP reports are already there. Um, if you have any questions, um, uh, give me a call. Um, but uh, let's pause uh, just for a minute and, and ask the panel, um, do you have any questions? About the scope and, and so on, I think that, you know, the scope is obviously very broad um, and very demanding and um, uh, it's a challenge. Yes, regarding the scope. So I understand that we're charged with coming up with a recommendation whether or not to ban any additional phthalates. Yes. Um, ban is uh, is um, sort of the final tool. Does this charge, and, and rather rough maybe, um, does this charge mean uh, to consider alternative regulatory activities or is it really ban yes or no? Well, you know, um, we think of, uh, I mean, you're right, in, if we were doing, uh, if the staff were doing an ordinary rulemaking activity, the ban is the, the most mm -hmm. we can do. It's the uh, death sentence, whatever. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's the most severe. Um, and in fact, we would have to exhaust all that we, we would have to, in order for us to do that, we would have to say nothing else would do mm -hmm. um, and various other findings. You have a little more lat under the, because of the CPSIA, you have a little more freedom than that. Um, I think you can recommend anything you want. If you could recommend something less than a ban or, you know, additional information, research is needed, to de make a determination, uh, you know, I, I don't think you're limited to just that. And, and for us, you know, we don't ban the chemical per se. We, we're not EPA. Uh, we can't ban it from existence. What we, what we do is we put a limit on its use in particular products. So it, some people call it a, a partial ban, um, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's not a, a complete and total Act. So that means that when we consider things like bicycles and, uh, you know, camping products, you, you, that's in a different category than mouthing of a, uh, of a teether because clearly there are a lot of differences in terms of contact and potential for exposure. Abs absolutely. And I also think that when you get beyond, you know, if, if you think of the teethers and soft plastic toys as the sort of core products, right. uh, other child care products, I think as the scope of that regulation gets, if you broaden it, looking at things like uh, you know, sporting goods and so on, right. the, the, there's probably less exposure to phthalates as you expand mm -hmm. anyway. Um, um, this is something that, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be easy um, when you broaden it. You know, again, we, when we knew that this uh, rule was coming, we, we didn't anticipate the, the scope of it. We were focused on, you know, rubber duckies and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that definitely broadens it, but on the other hand, uh, I, I think the potential exposure from some of these products uh, is much lower. And, and that, that helps me because it's the, the idea of the contact frequency, the contact intensity, which will lead to a dose of meaningful 
a meaning right. because it, I think we have to prioritize that rather clearly because not all exposures are equal. I think uh, prioritize is the, is the key word. And when you're looking, I mean, and, uh, uh, when you try to estimate exposure for, I mean, these broad categories, sure. it's got to be, um, it, it's not going to look like what we did for DINP. It's, it's going to be a different approach, a, a much broader approach, I, th I would think. Another question. Um, so on the slide, you were talking about looking for level of no harm to yes. certain individuals. Can I put quotes around the word no? Well, <laughs> As opposed, absolutely, I, mean, I think that or can we, what uh, we, I call it an acceptable daily intake. Mm -hmm. EPA calls it a reference dose. It, it's a level of where you think the risk is negligible. And we get to define what negligible means? Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's the kind of thing that a, a toxicolo as a toxicologist would define it. Um, you, cause, because you can't, uh, uh, you can't know everything. It's, it's, it's more about it, what you don't know than what you know. I mean, you can't set a level based on what you don't, well, what you don't know. Right. What I'm thinking about, though, is it seemed at one point one of my graduate students was working on something about uh, sort of acceptable levels of risk. Yeah. And there are actually Supreme Court um, cases that have considered what acceptable might mean. Uh, I, I don't remember the, the case, but where people actually talk about society's risk. Right. And, and in fact. I mean, are, the, are those kinds of reports could be made available? Uh, we, we could try to find. I'm not uh, aware of a Supreme Court. I mean, this is the kind of thing uh, for cancer risk was, had, was a, a topic discussed uh, a number of years ago. I mean, what's an acceptable risk for something like cancer where there is no <coughs> dose where the risk is zero, or at least you believe that? Um, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, it's not just a scientific question, it's a societal question. It's something for us, the commission would decide. We would say, it, suppose there's a cancer risk. We would say the cancer risk from using this product is something in a million, and then they would decide what's acceptable. Um, you know, and that answer might vary depending on if it's children or if it's adults and so on. Um, um, you know, right now, looking at the NRC report, we're talking about um, setting a, something like a more akin to a, an acceptable daily intake or a reference concentration. I mean, I don't know what methodology you're ultimately going to use, but it's going to be you're either above or below. And if you're below, then you assume that the risk is negligible. I don't know if you're going to get into... Uh, calculating actual risks. I mean, it would be, we'd all, of course, like to do that, but um, we'll uh, deal with that acceptable risk question um, when we come to it, I guess. That, that's partly clarifying my the question I'm going to ask now. You can, are we really in the business here uh, with establishing, say, whatever you want to call it, acceptable daily intakes, etc.? Or, is the emphasis rather on um, estimating or judging margins of exposure, which is very different? Well, I mean, th those are the, two the, different the, approaches. The former will make a lot of work, I think, the latter less Okay, so. the former, I think, it's how, you know, it, this is all uh, subject to interpretation. I read that as a regulatory uh, scientists looked at that and said, oh, they mean an ADI or a, a ref, an RFC. Um, so, I mean, margin expo of exposure is a valid approach. Uh, that works. You know, I think it works for me. I um, may make it easier. You mean you talk in here about exposures, and if we can prioritize and systematically eliminate some of them, that may make life a lot easier. Yeah. 
Okay, that, that's reassuring to hear. So we, we would be free in, in that. I, I, I'm asking because uh, deriving an ADI is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That's true. And, I mean, act, well, not that um, you're bound by them. In our tax reviews, we, we derive sort of provisional ADIs for a variety of endpoints for each chemical. I mean, you, you don't have to use them, but but they're there, the information is, the basic information is there. Um, I think, you know, you're, as a group, you're here for your expertise. And um, if you're, you know, want to, uh, uh, if your judgment is to take a certain approach to this, I think that's fine. As long as, uh, you know, we're addressing the concern. What, what this uh, mandate has, it's really, they're concerned about, cumulative risks in sensitive populations and so on and so forth. And I think as long as uh, we address the spirit of these things, the methodology I don't think um, um, matters because you're going to use the best methodology that you can. I'm sorry, I'm firing a lot of questions. It's okay. Um, one other question also of enormous relevance to our work. There's in Europe uh, a route to um, to dealing with these, uh, which is called the substitution route, meaning that in cases where you have for a certain chemical in a certain product already a substitute, mm -hmm. which can be used, you, if you like, short circuit all this uh, time consuming and arduous toxicological risk assessment and say, right, we're not doing this, there is a substitute, that's it, use it, and then the decision is made to restrict or ban the use of that certain chemical in a product, but without going through the labors of, of a toxicological risk assessment. Do you see what I mean? Well, this I, is sort of a pra pragmatism which yeah. is emerging in Europe. The alternative would be to say the trigger value or the trigger for a ban would have to be um, a toxicological risk assessment yeah. where the margin of exposure or whatever you want to call it, it just is judged too narrow and then you you make the decision. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure I follow, but I think there's a, a certain economy of, uh, of effort here. Once mm -hmm. you have a framework of how you're going to assess exposure, you can substitute one chemical for another if you know the migration rate or the vapor pressure or whatever it is you need. Um, I think that will help to simplify things. And, I, and obviously, they want us to look at substitutes. Uh, so, um, I, you know, I think there's got to be a way to, to simplify the, this as much as uh, to that extent. Yes. I may be becoming more confused rather than less because I begin to wonder with this family of chemicals and alternatives <clears throat> is what's, what's most important for us to make recommendations on? The approach that we would take so that as new phthalates or new substitutes, be, new alternatives become available on the market, there's, a, there's an approach that has been recommended that can be followed for the next one as opposed to calling another chap. Right, because of one more alternative, or is it specifically recommendations on these eleven chemicals? Well, what they're asking for, the bottom line is they want to know: Do we continue the interim ban of those three? Do we need to regulate any other phthalates or substitutes? Uh, that's the bottom line of what they want. Um, if you uh, in doing so, if we if you come up with a methodology and approach, um, obviously that's a big benefit because it can be applied um, as new alternatives become available. Um, you know, you're you're not limiting you're not limited to just saying you know yay or nay on some of these chemicals. Mm -hmm. And and that list of five substitutes. Um, I mean, it turned out to be a pretty good guess, but, you know, we didn't really know that they were going to be the ones um, when we started. Are there, are there precedents 
that have served as the basis for this threshold for negligible risk that would be helpful to us so that, I mean, there are some <clears throat> people who feel that because there is no benefit to be considered here, there is no balancing, it's strictly risk, mm -hmm. and any exposure represents risk. Therefore, there is no, accept, no acceptable exposure. And we're talking about chemicals for which some 90% of us have body burdens. So it's a meaningless statement to say that there is no safe level that doesn't help you as an agency. So are there precedents that would help us to have a better feel for what you've already accepted as this threshold for negligible risk? Well, let me think here. Um, uh, an RFC, for example, uh, an ADI, is generally defined as a level um, of exposure on for up to a lifetime that is to believe to be without significant harm. Um, uh, so if you can identify a level, uh, you, you know, it, it, it comes down to is it, you know, risk versus um, an ADI. I think if a tradi if you follow a traditional approach like an ADI or a reference concentration applying uncertainty factors, however you get there, however you do, the details don't matter. But if you follow that general approach, I think that would be generally recognized as a negligible risk level or, or, or whatever. Um, okay. I don't think that's a, a problem. Um, but your point about the the fact that we all have a body burden of this, um, of these chemicals, is well taken. I mean, that, I guess in a way that's the point of this. Um, and I feel like to some extent maybe the tail's wagging the dog. Um, if the exposure from these products turns out to be small compared to those other exposures, mm -hmm. um, then, um, you know, maybe the answer is for another agency to do the regulating. I don't know, but, um, um, or it may be that um, we can limit the pr uh, use of these products in children's products, but someone else has to worry about the other exposures. Um, but I think that the... Um, We'll have to see where this leads us, and if that's the case, um, I think your recommendations, uh, you know, you have latitude, and, and um, if banning the uh, uh, chemical in children's products is not going to do much good, then, you know, you could say that. Unfortunately, <clears throat> banning something that's used as a plasticizer drives the use of something else about which we know less. Uh, that's true, and uh, that's probably why the substitutes are in here, um, because someone raised that question. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see in five or ten years, uh, in the NHANES data, whether the you know, phthalates um, go way down and the adipates and citrates go way up and what the implications of that are. So do you know for sure that NHANES is monitoring these alternatives? Um, I, I wasn't aware of I that. don't know. I don't think they are, uh, but maybe they will. In the, I mean, I, I posed that question to the National Children's Study people, and they say, you know, there are ways... They have provisions so that as things change, if it if they see that a need to look at some other um, metabolites, there are, there are ways to do to adapt that within limit certain limitations. But yes, it would be nice to see some biomonitoring data on some of these other compounds. Okay, so one more question. So hey. we're talking. When you say the word ban, what you're thinking about is ban in 
children's products, right. children's toys. It's not banning, like you said, you're not the EPA. Right. So we're not talking about banning these plasticizers, period. I mean, our recommendation is we may do an, an exposure assessment or whatever and find, you know, a very small percentage mm -hmm. actually comes from certain products, which may be, you know, a little bitty part of overall exposure. So. Um, your word ban really is just for these sorts of products, particularly children's toys. Well, it's not and you can recommend, um, you know, uh, you can recommend anything. I mean, you can recommend that uh, a chemical be banned. I mean, we couldn't do it, but you can make that recommendation. What you could also recommend is that, uh, um, you know, uh, the scope of the ban um, as broad or narrow as you see fit. Um, usually there's a level because nowadays there's no such thing as zero of anything. So, you know, you come up with some practical level. Um, but you're, I, I think you have a lot of latitude into what you can recommend. Okay. And I mean, you know, you're, again, it's, <clears throat> your experts in it's it's your uh, scientific judgment that we're interested in. I, we don't want to limit you. I mean, we want to answer the charge questions, but we don't want to box you in to like yes no answers. But again, I see this as a, uh, among other things, a, it's a matter of prioritizing, you know, out, out of all these things that we can do, what are the ones that will give us the best answers? Um, I'm trying to think if there's any housekeeping things that we need to say. Um, we're coming up on the noon hour, and I think we'll break for lunch uh, from uh, noon to about one. Um, for the those of you in the audience, uh, there is a cafe downstairs in the south tower one of the other buildings on the ground floor. Uh, just take the elevator to the ground floor and walk. You can walk over there. If you walk that way toward the metro, you can find lots of, in lots of restaurants in Bethesda. Um, and uh, we'll con reconvene here at uh, one o'clock. Thank you.